and we're going to spend about an hour or 16 minutes, 60 minutes uh, with us. There will be a chance of um, Q&A and we will hopefully record the session whenever that's possible. So I think that the, the person who's, I think it's Donald, it's you that can record the session. So just if you can hit record somewhere, that'd yeah, be great. It's, it, it's already recording. It's already recording. That's amazing. Um, and then um, there are there's good next session is going to be in May. That's already out on Ticket Source. So I'm gonna we're gonna share all the links that you need to have, all the presentations that you hear today going to be shared with you after the the session. And I just wanted to um, mention a bit more about who are we going to be hearing from tonight. So we have Donald Gray, who's a professor in the School of Education in Aberdeen, who's currently working in developing the idea of garden schools with the organization uh, called One Seed Forward. And um, Bob Donald is a chair and founder of One Seed Forward, who's also with us here tonight. And then we're going to hopefully hear from Lindsay McBride, who's a school teacher from Oyen Primary. And she will sp speak to us more about the project called Grow, Grow for Good. So Lindsay has been um, scheduled to come tonight and uh, she's doing her best to, to make it here. Something's come up that's quite urgent for her. So she's hopefully making her way uh, or trying to go through the get ready for, for, for our session. If that, however, doesn't happen and, and Lindsay get, does get um, delayed, we have so much more to talk to you about that uh, Bob, both uh, Bob and Donald will be able to um, impart on you. So we have only 60 minutes and there's so much more to learn and know. So if Lindsay shows up, that, that'll be amazing. And if not, we'll uh, get Lindsay, we'll hear from Lindsay some other time and um, we will hear what exciting news um, both Donald and Bob have. So without further ado, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and pass on to our next speaker. Um, and I think that's me. Uh, so um, as uh, Natalia said, I'm uh, Donald Gray. I'm professor at the School of Education in uh, Aberdeen, and I've been working with uh, Bob, Bob Donald for some time now. I'm just getting my screen shared um, and uh, let me just put this on to full screen and uh, welcome everybody to the uh, April uh, webinar which we've done a few already we started in January so we've got a few done now um, and this is looking as all webinars looking at an aspect of developing a school garden um, and this month we are looking at observing and recording plant growth, why it's important to establish garden routines for pupils and which environmental factors may have an impact on a successful growing season. Um, so we're looking at tending to the gardens. I've actually put two, R we usually have one QR code, but I put two up because there's two things. One, these these uh, modules can be found both in, in the One Seed Forward uh, Garden Schools uh, uh, website um, and that top QR code will take you there. And there's also the University of Aberdeen. We've converted this into a kind of course which is modelled on the uh, uh, on the modules. So uh, again, that one will take you to this particular thing on tending to the gardens. Uh, in the previous webinar, we examined the steps involved in planting and how to consider the space that plants need in order to grow. This session, we'll have a look at what activities are required to tending these small seedlings on the school grounds and what learning experiences pupils can get from doing so. Um, and I've added some quotes to the slides, which from teachers and pupils in the uh, the project that we've been involved in with One Seed Forward. Um, and I'll just get my cursor to work. Um, so plants need adequate space both above and below the ground to properly to grow properly. Um, and vegetable plants expend a lot of energy uh, to bloom and produce fruit. And it's important that the stresses this induces are managed so they keep healthy and strong until they are harvested. So pupils could be allocated sections 
to the garden to observe the plants that they are growing. Um, observation is, is an important skill to develop. Uh, it, it comes into lots of different activities, science, maths, art and so on. So they can observe the plants that they are growing and be responsible for tending to the health of the plants they are in charge of. Um, in journals, they can use mathematical skills to record the amount of growing on a regular basis. And we did some of that with uh, developing graphs and charts. Um, and this could be counting the number of leaf, leaf buds or flowers, as well as the height and width of the plants they look after. Um, observing is a, a, a very uh, essential skill for art. And this can be combined with uh, drawing the various stages of the plant as it develops, or photographs taken that can be used as a slideshow to be presented at a school assembly. Uh, and this is what at one pupil at one school said, we learned, you know, it wasn't just about sticking things in the ground, it's about, to, you know, you do it nice and gentle. You have to treat the plants with respect to the vegetables with respect. Um, but when the, what are key actions to tending the school garden? One of them is establishing a water routine. That's a vital part of um, keeping the garden healthy and the plants growing. Regular watering will ensure the proper development of the seedlings as it grows. And pupils actually love to water. I mean, one of the, the, the keenest things they did in the projects we were involved in is to do watering. So it's important that they understand the amount of water that needs to be given. We stressed last time about the sensorial activities, the, the various senses that are involved and feeling and touching the soil is important here, it connects people to nature and is the best way to decide if water is needed. If it's been raining a lot, then the watering visits may be more of a checkup than a rush to the tap. So, you know, they have to recognise that it's not always necessary to water the plants. Sometimes there's been enough natural rainfall. Investigations should also be made on how much water the plant being looked after needs. Different plants require different amounts of water. So some like tomatoes and cucumbers are very thirsty and may need a daily top up to progress their growth, whilst others will be happy to be left alone for a while. I mean, ideally, you'll have access to rainwater captured in a water butt, um, or you may have close access to a tap so the watering doesn't become too messy on the school corridors. One of the schools we had, they filled up lots of containers with uh, with uh, water so they could carry it easily in and out of the school. But it's, it's, it's much better if you've got a close access like a water butt or a tap. Um, and interestingly, one of the teachers we spoke to actually mentioned the watering aspect, um, saying it's been good, like watching them just take ownership for something as well. And they're very protective about it. And they're constantly reminding me, you know, it's Monday, we need to go out, we need to water our garden. That was after the weekend, if it had been dry. Um, sorry, I missed that last quote. I'll just go back. I, I mentioned the tactile part of it. The soil becomes real to children when they start to touch it. Um, that's important to remember about the sensory experiences. Um, constant reviews of the spaces for the plants are also necessary. So the, the removal of excess seedlings competing for space will provide healthier and bigger crops. Sorry, it's jumped on. Um, this process called th is called thinning. If done carefully, can mean that the uprooted seedlings may be gently replanted further apart. Because it's always a shame to have to throw out plants that you've you've uh, started growing. But um, and in in effect, the uh, that's sometimes not possible. But it is a learning curve for pupils about the sacrifice in their garden for the overall benefit of all the rest of the plants there. So we may need to take some of these. Plants that can't be replanted elsewhere, they'll go in the compost and they'll still be useful because they'll be used to, for nutrition for following years. 
Uh, plants may also need to be staked uh, if they're tall and climbing, such as peas and beans, and this should be done at an early stage so you don't cause damage to the forming roots by forcing the stake through them into the soil. We have to recognise that the, while it's nice to have ownership of your garden, the garden space is inhabited by many living things, and we need to recognise this in our routines. Some may be occasional visitors like cats or even foxes, like I have in my garden, uh, which leave traces behind. Uh, foxes are notorious for digging up things and they often leave little holes in my garden. Some may be other pupils who accidentally disturb the plants whilst playing, and some may be pests like snails. Um, when we remove slugs and snails, we put them into the compost heap as they are great for breaking down organic matter and are contributing to the decomposition of our material. They're better in the compost heap than being in the vegetable space, munching on the vegetables and herbs that we are cultivating. I also heard on a radio program, this is going back a few months now, uh, someone who, a specialist in slug control, a scientist, was saying that one of the best things they'd find for attracting slugs was fermenting sourdough. Um, so it is worth exploring and trying different attractants to gather and remove the slugs and snails from your garden. Uh, a daily routine of removal should be established, which is probably best done first thing in the morning, uh, as the slugs are most active at night uh, when we are not in school. And of course, talking about gardening and spaces, well, I've said a couple of quotes here. Um, we recognise that the children themselves recognised one of the schools had frogs, a little pond, um, and so they recognised the sharing of the garden with the frogs. And they also recognised that they could use the produce from the, the garden in, in the school. So even the school dinner ladies were involved somehow in the garden. And uh, of course, gardening without weeding is usually uh, impossible at some sites. Uh, and weeds compete with vegetables for water, nutrition and space in the gardens. And they often have negative co connotations. Um, weeds are described by the Royal Horticultural Society as wild plants in the wrong place, although they also point out that they have benefits for wildlife in the garden. A scientist, a prominent black scientist by the name of George Washington Carver of the early 20th century is said to have described weed as a flower growing in the wrong place. But weeds are important as they are a vital source of food for insects and pollinators especially at times of year when these sources can be difficult to find. But if you want to get rid of your weeds, you first need to check how they grow and spread. Uncultivated bare soil will also attract unwanted plants to grow as weeds. So that's why it's quite useful to have those areas covered um, with plants growing or somehow um, avoiding uh, the, the weeds becoming established. Uh, pupils should understand which plants are vegetables and which are weeds and a weeding routine established to remove these from the growing areas. One idea to make this easier is to create a separate weed bed where weeds are actually tended to and labelled so children can compare and review a plant before removing it. These beds also act as go-to areas for bees and insects. We often talk about wildflower meadows and things being established to um, allow for biodiversity. Weeds should, however, be removed before they go to seed in all areas of the garden so that the volume can be controlled from year to year. If you, if you stop them seeding, then it means that you're not going to be inundated with weeds the following year. Some weeds, it should be remembered, are edible and pupils can research this too. Ground elder, for example, is an invasive rhizomatous weed, but it is believed to have been in the UK since Roman times and brought, brought here as a herb. Dandelions are also edible with young leaves often added to salads or used in stir fries and many people throw them into smoothies for a nutritious boost. Dandelion flower petals are also edible and can be used in a variety of dishes. Um, 
and they can also be used to make a delicious dandelion syrup. I remember collecting loads of dandelion flower heads during COVID time and making a dandelion syrup. But as always, make sure you know what plant you're picking before eating it. So this child said there's a small area inside the garden and there's tons and tons of weeds in it. And we were trying to get all the weeds, but then they spread and they're all about the garden now. So they had a bit of work to do in getting their, their thing. Uh, to the garden involves active and ongoing processes of observing plants as they grow and maintaining the garden in the appropriate conditions. So regular routines and recording can improve people's health and well-being through outdoor activity and connecting to nature. Developing their numeracy, maths and artistic skills, as well as demonstrating skills of scientific inquiry and investigation using practical techniques. So tending will hopefully lead to a successful harvest and harvesting is the topic for the next uh, the next webinar. But there's a couple of little uh, observations from teachers here. The project links in with eating and nutrition. The designing was maths and science, learning about germination and linked in with our science curriculum. So the benefits to the curriculum are well known, but the children also have different points of view about what was um, what was it, the, the, what were the good things about the gardens? And I'll just let you read those yourself. Uh, in particular, we find that a, a number of people talked about getting their mental health better. Uh, so having this responsibility tending to the garden um, helps them to develop a kind of uh, affiliation with the garden and, and helps their mental well-being. And one final comment was, if we have a garden, it just makes a huge more possibilities. Um, and that is the end of this little presentation on tending to the garden. I don't know if. Uh, has Lindsay turned up, I wonder. Thank you, Professor Gray. Um, I don't I'm not seeing Lindsay in the no. participants list, so um, perhaps where would you, where would you like to go next? Well, I might just come in with a couple of observations on top of um, Donald's uh, sort of like presentation. So thank you, Donald. Um, I'm Bob Donald from One Seed Forward, for those of you who haven't met me already. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Donald's absolutely right um, about the whole sort of like tending processes. Um, I think it's important about routines and it's not just about routines during school hours. But it's also about looking at um, what you can do during uh, school holidays. Um, the involvement of the community, if that's at all possible, is really quite important. Uh, if you're able to get um, community involvement, um, whether that be parents um, of the pupils or whether it's actually sort of like outside groups, um, it really sort of like helps to sort of make a decision about how the tending process goes. Um, I think that one of the issues that we'd certainly seen in Aberdeen um, was that um, just because of some of the ways of the layouts of the schools, it wasn't actually possible to go in and uh, so like do some tending over the school holidays. So I think that means that what you need to think about when you're looking at your planning of what you're going to be planting is what can grow within the time period that you've got available. Um, and well, we know the weeds will grow, uh, but uh, <laughs> anything that you'd actually want to be looking at harvesting points, etc. So I think it's important to try and see as part of your processes and to try and get as much involvement as you can um, with parental groups and also with uh, community. Um, one other thing, just as a kind of a, maybe sort of like a bit of advice, um, if, you're, if you are sowing seeds with uh, pupils and you're looking at the weed bed and trying to work out what are weeds and what aren't, um, what I quite often do is I, I actually sow quite a few, a few seeds as a clump at the end of a row because then that will, they should be grown at the same time. So if you're looking at a row, hopefully you'll be able to distinguish the, 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 the two seed, the two leaves of the plant that you're trying to grow uh, rather than the seeds and anything else. Um, but that was the only observations I had um, uh, from the from the tending uh, point of view. Um, I'm not sure that uh, perhaps, uh, um, Natalia, if you want to see if anyone's got any specific questions at the moment before we then sort of like a reach out about some other things. Yes, I, I, I had a question. I was thinking um, dandelion head syrup. So I just quickly Googled it just to see if my question was completely crazy and everybody knew an answer and I was the only one didn't. 
Um, so what did you use it for? I mean, did you eat it? What, what did you use it for? Uh, I can't remember now. I think I poured it on my porridge in the morning or so, whatever, you know. Uh, like a honey, but, uh, like a yeah, condiment. It's a, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pourable thing. Yeah, yeah, um, okay. Okay, yeah. that's, that's yeah, cool. Yeah, it's quite it's quite often referred to as dandelion honey. Um, you do need to pick quite a lot of flower heads, okay? Yeah, yeah. Just a bit of a warning there. Uh, and then what you do is you put them into boiling water and you let it so like soak for about 12 hours, then you strain it off. And then you put in, which is great, equal amounts of uh, sugar to the, to the amount of water that you've got um, that's been produced through the dandelion. Um, it keeps really well. Yeah. And so it's really good. You just got to make sure, as yeah. Donald said as well, about making sure that people um, don't have any allergies, any pollen allergies or anything like that. So you just have to ensure that you're careful about knowing what you can eat. But it tastes really, really good. It but, tastes good. Um, yeah. But bees are, bees are better. <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah. Be better <laughs> at making honey than humans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, I'm more adept to it. Yeah. Well, if you let, let the bees to the dandelions first and then you can take second go, you know. <laughs> it's very interesting yeah thank you any any questions from um the rest of you guys um uh, let me open the chat to see i'm not seeing any any particular questions um wondered if whilst maybe people are thinking about their questions you, t you let us know a little bit more about what you have been up to. So both of you love your growing food, love your gardens, love your nature. So anytime, I, I just love picking both your brains um, on all things nature. So what have you been up to recently? Anything exciting? Well, I would tell you, but I think Lindsay's just actually managed to come into the oh. chat. So... Um, I'm not sure, if, uh, Lindsay, if you're if you're able to sort of uh, sort of basically come on the line yes. with us. Hi there. Hello. Hi. Yes, I totally apologise. Been one of those days, I'm afraid. Um. So yes, I'm here. Great. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for for um managing to make it. I was just a way to pick um Bob's brain and Donald's brain on all things nature because there's always loads of interesting stuff. And they were just about to answer my question when you came oh, in. Oh, sorry. You're, you're a, no, no, but you're a better option still because we promised you, we promised you to the to the people, so to the participants. So it's really great to have you here. So if you need a moment, that's quite all right. Right. If if you're happy to just share your screen and start your bit, that's also okay. So what would you prefer? Yes, I mean, I'm I'm happy to share. I'm, I, I don't know if you said I'm a bit of a caveat that it's actually my colleague Rona Moyer that was meant to do the presentation. Um, and unfortunately, she's not able to. So I'm kind of a bit winging it. Is yeah. that OK? Um, I have put together uh, some some slides and things, but really just to talk through what we did and, and maybe a little bit about what I've kind of learned and um, going forward so that's if great just if you could if you could just share. just tell us a bit more about um yourself you know and sort of introduce yourself yeah. thank no you problem. so um i'm lindsay mcbride i was head teacher at oin school for about four and a half years um i have now moved to craigie var school um which the good thing is, and I'll, I'll go through once I share my screen um, about kind of my, my journey with the outdoor learning and garden schools, but both schools have got fantastic outdoor spaces. Um, and, and that's really sort of why I am when I am just with with garden schools and having worked with uh, Bob and and all the lovely people um, for the outdoor learning and owls. So um, let me just get this sorted and we'll hopefully see if that works just get this up is that working yes we can we can see that yeah thank you fantastic so um Again, I'm, I'm apologising for the sort of ad hoc basis of this, so I'll just whiz through. So um, 
when I arrived at Oin School, I'd kind of done quite a lot of work on um, outdoor learning, but that was in Glasgow, so a very, very different context. Um, and when I saw what the, the resources were in terms of outdoor learning um, and gardening, um, I thought, yeah, OK, this is we need to really um, think about what's right for the school. And um, however, unfortunately, um, although I was quite enthusiastic about outdoor learning, uh, my my gardening expertise was was not the best, shall we say, hence the reason for the little image on that slide. Um, so it, I, it was very much a case of learning along with uh, the kids as far as I was concerned. Um, so what I'm going to talk through just as I get um, through the pictures is just really how it kind of started small, even though the outdoors space at Oin was quite overwhelming, I think, um, to start with. Um, how we embedded outdoor learning and some of the reasons and the catalysts for that. Um, and then I'd like to talk quickly about the Food for Thought grant that really was sort of the, the last year that I was at, at that OIN that really sort of took us to that next stage. Um, and then again, starting at Craigie Var just um, at the start of this session, kind of what I've learned and what I'm hoping to do um, going forward there. So, um, what I kind of stood for and what I was really passionate about was outdoor learning, as I've said. However, um, I was mostly infant based um, and my practice. And um, when I was doing that, I was doing a lot of learning through play and forwarding that within the school. So another one of my sort of passions. Um, also digital skills um, and of course, skills for life, learning and work. So with the sort of um, research that's been coming out um i think you'll all be aware of the fact that you know we <laughs> we realized that in 2022 that 74 percent of children were spending less time outdoors than prison inmates which was a statistic that sort of scared me quite a lot um there's for obvious reason, research is indicating that frequent outdoor play sort of might mitigate that connection between higher screen time, which is up by about 50% in recent years, um, and then later suboptimal neurodevelopment, um, a clear link there. And then taking responsibility for helping a plant to grow, being trusted to care for it and helping it to thrive, being, brings feel, feelings of pride, empowerment, being um, in nature has a calming effect and gardening has been shown to reduce stress levels, improve mood and enhance self-esteem. So with that sort of drive for promoting digital skills, but still wanting that balance of getting the kids outdoors, um, and I'm also very passionate about um, developing habits of mindfulness and um, self-regulation, um, which I think is really important at the moment. Um, it it's made sense to sort of say, right, OK, I, I need to upskill myself um, and this is the best way to do it by getting the kids out there. So, as I said, um, I joined Oin School at, in 2019. Uh, this was the part of the outdoor space. So really uh, lovely, really lucky to have it. Um, but that was from quite a few years before that picture, before I joined. And um, sort of this was more what I was, was faced with, um, which again was fantastic and great. But as you can see from the back, you're know, very overgrown. And I think that is one of the challenges as well, just keeping and maintaining these spaces. Um, to the left of the picture there, you see um, uh, one of our willow structures, um, but, you know, desperately needed taming. And again, quite an overwhelming task to think about where do we start? So um, I love this wee quote. I think everything you've got to start small and then think about where do I want to go? And I'll be perfectly honest, I didn't really know at that point what we were going to do and how the outdoor learning was going to go, how the gardening was going to go. Um, so I kind of took a lot of lessons from people around about me and um, a lot of people that had more experience in, in gardening. As I say, I, I can quite easily kill a, a cactus. Um, so really sort of helping uh, the kids to see that I didn't really know what I was doing as well. 
So um, again, I'm just going to whiz through some photographs. When we started, um, I thought it was really important to, to match what we were doing outside with inside to, to link the two. So, you know, when in our uh, projects and things, we were looking at, at the earthworms, we were looking at worm arrays and soil, we were looking at growing things, seedlings on the uh, on windowsills and using more of that space, which then moved on to our pots and our planters um, and you can see again at the top left you know that's kind of the daffodils in them but nothing that was really um, the kids could use or um, be really sensory as well I like the herbs because there was the the, the, the smell the taste the feel um, and so that was kind of the, the first small steps and that was really all we did and then um, COVID-19 sort of hit and everything just went a little bit crazy However, it was definitely a, a sort of kick up the bottom, excuse my language, to get us outside, not just gardening, not just, you know, learning for sustainability, but just getting outside. So we had lunches outside. We were at that point, and I will say we were really, really lucky to have um, a member of staff who was forest school trained. So we learned an awful lot about the types of activities we could do to link those outdoor learning experiences to the indoor experiences. And I think that's one of the main challenges with people that are not confident in, in taking the kids outside is knowing what to do with them and possibly going outside just for the sake of going outside. So we learned an awful lot from um, Shirley, who um, works for Leaf, Leafy Trails and does lots of fantastic things. So we were using our outdoor space. So you can see not just, well, not any gardening in these photos, actually, but we were using our willow. We'd learned how to do that. The children were getting more and more used to being in the outdoor space, getting more used to the routines, getting used to treating the outdoor space as um, a, another classroom. And actually, I think that's really, really important when you are trying to, to set up your school garden or do something outdoors, because the, the first few times I know people will probably appreciate, you know, it, it's pretty much a riot, um, you know, if it's new to the kids. So we were in that really lucky position of the children really getting used to just, it wasn't abnormal to go outside. It wasn't abnormal to grab your wellies. It wasn't abnormal to sit and listen to uh, staff outside and have discussions outside. And it was also not overwhelming to be in that huge space that we had. Um, but as the same as you would do inside the classroom, boundaries were set, you know, where the children could go, timings um, and, you know, obviously all the safety instructions and things we had to, to teach the children as we went along. So I'd say the next sort of catalyst, if we're talking about school gardens, um, was really uh, Rona's introduction uh, to uh, One Seed Forward in garden schools and, and Bob in particular was fantastic. So we started working a little bit on some of the projects that were available and that were out there. Um, the Shoebox Garden, we attempted the Grow Your Own Loaf. I will say, I think we managed to have about three um, sort of ears of corn <laughs> of wheat that we actually managed to grow, but uh, we attempted it and then we had all potatoes and, and the usual things. But Bob really did give us that help and that pointer. Um, and I really would say the, the garden schools with that really sort of good framework uh, set us on our way and gave the teachers confidence about where we could go and what we should be doing. Um, <laughs> again, because I needed that and I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone. So those big areas that you saw um, on that sort of second photo at the back, this is where um, I thought, OK, we've got some really good areas at the moment that are, are beautiful and colourful, but essentially not being used to uh, their maximum potential. Um, and it was quite a, a quite a thought to clear those thought, you know, this is going to take an awful lot of work, but my goodness, did the kids enjoy ripping out all those weeds and uh, really getting their, their hands dirty. Because, of course, they were used to doing that as well. They were used to handling the tools. They were just um, some more than others. But you, you could see the teamwork. You could see the skills for life developing and the resilience um, and actually just the interest in what they were finding in the soil, um, what they were ripping out, what was a weed, what wasn't, what did they do when they came across something really tricky that they couldn't remove. Um, and the kids, again, really taking ownership of it because it was them that did it. And what a difference you could tell from when they started to when they finished. 
Um, so sort of building on that starting small, um, the next step, I suppose, was where he said, right, we want the kids to be able to have choice. We want them to be able to see what they're doing to make the same mistakes that I make. Um, so the next thing we did was sort of say, right, we'll get some tires, we'll paint them and we gave them the choice whether they worked in, by themselves or with a partner. Uh, they decided what they wanted to grow. They did a little bit of research on it. Um, we went and bought the seeds for the things that they wanted to grow. And of course, that's what we did. Um, along with that, uh, we also had a sort of bigger planter that we had. Um, we thought, OK, we'll we'll use that as well. Um, and this was this was actually the the grow your own loaf planter so before this had been um so the, the grow your own loaf planter we had but we then used that for potatoes and we decided to see whether um the straw method was better than the soil method um, and do a little bit of science in there and at the the left hand side you can see even the, the really young children getting involved so um this is sort of the next stage of the older class was we gave the responsibility to doing the uh, the tires and really sort of having that choice. So um, I'm glad to say that they were really successful. As you can see, some chose to do flowers, some chose to do um, tomatoes, which weren't quite so successful at that point, and um, strawberries, lots of other things. Um, and the kids really did take care of them. They took responsibility for them. They checked on their tire. And um, they were always keen to show everybody what they'd been doing. So um, it was after that that we had um, met the criteria for our stage two seedling award, which was fantastic. Um, and then we, uh, the following year, we decided to apply for the Food for Th uh, Thought grant. And that really did mean that we took a step up in terms of what we could do, but also in the planning. Um, I think up to that point, it had kind of been right, OK, we've got this framework, we'll work through it and see where we get to. Um, but by then, our sort of vision for it had developed and we thought, OK, well, what really is possible here? Um, and with a little bit of funding, we decided that um, really we needed to be able to have a sustainable um, growing area that was um, decent areas that we had to plant that could be well maintained. And it was, you know, more like a, an allotment type um, sort of set up. So with the Food for Thought grant, so we actually named our project um, Grow for Good because we wanted it not just to be a, a one off and then, you know, that was it. It was over. And I'll speak just at the end about the challenge, because that really is one of the challenges, I think, to, to maintain and sustain your, your growing um, with the schools. So we were um, lucky to have our raised beds uh, built and we had then lots of work to do in terms of, again, bringing that inside and outside together. So the children were working out how much compost they would need. They were working out, you know, how big we would need the area of the, the cardboard, as you can see, so that we had our liners in um, and lots of different things. But really a, a huge project that did have that IDL um, component where it was the kids were in charge. They were leading it and deciding what we were doing, both when we were doing our, our you know usual maths and when we were outside with our outdoor learning. Um, part of our Grow for Good um, thing uh, project was that we really wanted to get a lot of community partners involved. We were really lucky with our, our parent council and our parents. Um, we had a greenhouse that needed a little bit of um, TLC. It was donated from a parent, uh, I think, the year before. But we hadn't really used it. And um, I'm, I think that's still something that we are going to um well, I say we, I'm not at the school anymore, but I, I think we could have used that to um, greater effect. But the kids were involved in, in sort of renovating it, making sure it was fit for purpose. We had um, the children write to um, companies. So we had donations of compost that the parents helped to pick up and, and put in. And then, of course, we had uh, the deciding what we were going to plant and all the research and investigating about what we could plant, what would be good, what could we use in terms of the school kitchens um, and what we could use in terms of the community, because we wanted to, to share what we grew in our produce with the community. 
Um, so the rest is really just a little bit of showing kind of what we achieved. We used our Willow again. It's a fantastic resource. Um, so trying to tie together that we had a uh, lots of lettuce, lots and lots of lettuce, um, which we bagged up. Um, we had uh, we had it in the, the school canteen. We also involved the Geary Kitchen, who came in and did some lessons on um, on food preparation, on how we could use some of the produce. And then um, what I'd hoped to do if I'd stayed at the school was the older pupils then share that information and teach the younger ones so that we kept that knowledge and those skills within the school. Now, I apologise because this is the only photo I seem to have of our Joroform composter. Um, I got very excited about compost. Um, I, th I think it's a, an age thing. Um, but this rotary uh, thermal composter was was great and I wish I was there to see what had happened with it, but just the learning involved in ratios and everything that we needed uh, to know. So again, a work in progress when I left and certainly something that I'd like to learn more about. Um, so just kind of rounding off towards the end um, of last session when I left, we had a fantastic um, array of produce. We advertised that on, on our Twitter site. We put it out to the parents for parents just to come and take what they needed, take what they wanted. Um, we also put it to, I think, the Inch community site um, and just kind of try to open up the 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 wider community to, to come in and use it and with some lovely messages and pictures of it being used which was great um and i think that one of the uh the difficult things is of course and i'm sure you've spoken about it um previously is that you know the harvest of everything happens over the summer <laughs> and that was certainly a challenge we had enough local kind of parents to help us with maintaining that um, at my new school at Craigie Farr we don't have that and that's going to be something that I'll really have to think about is how to um, take that and, and make sure that we're, we're sustaining it over the summer at that really important crucial point. Um, so I know um, from when I left there's still growing going on there's still potatoes um, as you can see they're, they're giving away um so the challenge like i say i think is getting everybody out we were lucky that with the outdoor learning we had sort of lots of resources and things that we did and um we had the skills that were kind of gradually built up within our children what i would like to do at my new school is um make sure that the children are involved right from the very start definitely do the sort of starting small and um, we had to, and what we'll do is, is plan together, but um, I feel far more confident doing it this time. Um, and I think particularly knowing that the Garden Schools programme has been really useful. Um, I, I hope that wasn't too too off the cuff there, um, but um, that's that's where we were and it's it's been really fun. Sounds um, wonderful. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I think I like the, the whole from a complete beginner to lots and lots of green lettuce and lots of kids involved and um, involving the community, knowing who to speak to, speak to Bob <laughs> and um, just um, growing it. So you show that it's possible for even if you have absolutely no idea what you're doing, which I'm sure you, you weren't at that stage, but it is possible to grow and build and learn from it it doesn't have to be super massive you don't have to be massive experts and there's lots of help out there so just knowing how to pull that together i think that's really really useful to see i am going to see if anybody else has any questions for for lindsay from i'm going to look in the chat you can also just unmute yourselves and just um, ask ask away or if you want to type in the chat, I'm keeping an eye on that. Any any comments from Bob <laughs> or from from Donald? <clears throat> um, yeah, it's great. It's, it's it's great. I always loved coming to Line, Lindsay because um, everybody was so engaged, and every time I went, it just seemed to be more and more happening, which was really really good. Um, can I just ask you about Craigievar and um, so like uh, what you think the the challenges is going to be as far as um sort of like um outdoor learning there compared to your experience that you've had at Oin as to sort of like what you think the steps are process because um, it may be that the people who are 
on the call um, may have a similar sort of situation where they're coming new into school. So just any kind of a, a maybe sort of like thoughts just about what's happening in your current school would be good. Yeah, um, excuse my very rude son who is bothering me right now. Um, apologies. Um, so at the moment, we have just planted a willow tunnel <laughs> just uh, about a month ago. Uh, we've got a wildlife sort of area. It's not, I wouldn't say a garden, but a wildlife area with trees. It's a small wooded area. But other than that, in terms of growing space, we haven't got an awful lot. So uh, we've got a couple of raised beds that um, select groups of children more as a sort of nurture group, tend to have a responsibility for so that's my starting point um, and then obviously I've got the chance to let them sort of lead that and um, they work with um, Ian Gilliland which is great he's um, sort of taking a, a few children out at a time and and working at, at you know planting just a couple of bits um, so using them as, as sort of our experts um, you know I hope to maybe use the produce because I think that's really important that the bits that we've got so we've got some rhubarb we've got potatoes cheating in the little classroom and things like that. It's going to be really important to actually see that produce being used for the other children, I think, to, to really get engaged. Um, it's, you know, once they know a purpose for it, once they can see it. And I am, you know, as, as at OIM, I think, and I've felt myself, their confidence in it will increase. And I've seen that even just with, you know, the weaving of the willow, they were kind of a little bit reticent to get involved in that. But, you know, as I sort of start doing things, and that was the, one of the other things I noticed at OIN, is if I was out doing supervision, you know, I would just have a wee, you know, weed or I would go and water or I'd say to somebody, oh, can you grab a watering can? And children are great. If they start doing something, they're, you know, it's like moths to a flame. Others will wander over and then the children will start that conversation about it. Um, and it's, it, it's really good to to have them pass that knowledge on and it's not just coming from from the adults so having that sort of core group I think of kids will be really important and um, I would hope to eventually have some bigger areas um, but again thinking about how we maintain that over that summer period when we really are quite in the middle of nowhere so um, it's difficult although our parents are great and I'm sure would would help us to maintain that. Thank you. So there is a, a question in the chat. Shall I just read it out? Yeah. So Willow can be, so it's Carolyn Mitchell and I'm going to ask Namumu where it, if she could type what school she's from. Um, so Willow can be invasive. How do you keep it from encroaching on other areas? We're very limited for space and are lucky enough to be able to utilize the local park, but don't think the community would appreciate it taking over. Would love to get the children involved with Willow. Uh, well, I would certainly say um, building just a willow structure on a, you know, a turfed area. So um, if you've got any sort of turfed area, even a small structure, you'll be amazed at how much willow and resource you can actually use from that, whether it's the small little whips for weaving or the bigger, um, you know, it's so fast growing. Um, we've got a lot of really quite wet areas, so it's really great. It's a really thirsty wood, so it helps a little bit with all the water. So um, at Oin, we had three really well-established structures, and the problem with that was they'd grown so tall so the children couldn't really maintain it anymore. So actually, when you're uh, when we were building our tunnel, um, we didn't want it as tall as, you know, even our primary sevens. I said, I want it the, the height that the primary sevens need to duck to get in so that the kids can start, you know, weaving and maintaining it. And that's really, really important because then it just, it, 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 it isn't invasive. It's got its own sort of purpose. It's got its own space and it can be, you know, in, in any sort of part of, of a um a turfed area. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, hi, sorry, Carolyn here. Um, we're I'm I'm at Kearney Primary School. Um, it's a very rural school. There's one class, twenty three students, and me. Um, and a PSA. Um, our playground is literally concrete. There's nothing else at all, mm. and it's very small. We do have a gate that goes out into the local parks. So we are exceptionally lucky that we can go out and use it and the community have allowed us to set up raised gardens mm. um, which they come right. and help with during the summer which is really nice um, and they've also with, through the community we've also managed to plant fruit trees and hedgerows as well to encourage wildlife back in so 
we have been really lucky over the last couple of years to kind of establish that sort of routine with the community. Um, but Willow is an area that I've done a couple of like outdoor learning things over the last six to, six to 12 months and Willow comes up every single time. Um, and I just think it would be the amount of things you can do with the kids with it um, and how they can utilise it as well. I just I would love to be able to grow it, but I, I'm just so worried about putting it in and then it just going, whoa, and take, kind of taking over. It is, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, I think it'd probably be worth asking, you know, can you build a small structure? Because it doesn't need to be a tunnel. It could be, you know, a sort of little arbour. Of, of we're, because we had some willow left over, we're just kind of chucking it in the grass and weaving bits and kind of working out what it's going to be. And even if you just stick it in the ground or, um, you know, a, a big pot or a planter, it'll grow. It's so resilient. So um, you can cut it and just plant it and it'll just regrow from the cuttings that you take. Someone had said yeah. that and I was a bit, I was, I didn't do any research or anything, but I was like, I couldn't understand how that would work. But if that works, then that's going to make it a yeah, lot easier because we can get that does. from parents. You can take a, a bit, like maybe slightly longer than and thicker than a pencil. Um, and the, the thing with willow that I do like, like I said, I can kill um, cacti. So willow is, yeah, <laughs> willow is is pretty good because I'm pretty confident that you know even if I kill a bit of it, there'll still be plenty more. <laughs> yep. So. I, yeah, I would say just try. And I know that um, at OIN, you can, they'll be happy to to give you some bits. And once we get started, there's there's Willow, you can go and just quick off. Um, nice. So it's really inexpensive and honestly, such a fantastic resource. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's, that's wonderful to hear about Willow. I'm just learning so much here. Um, so there is a question about Willow in the chat, and I was trying to see whether what you were talking about is answering this teacher's question. But I think I'll just read the questions out for the purposes of the recording because they don't show up on the the chats, don't show up on the recording uh, for for people listening to this for the future. So the first question about, and then possibly that has been answered, but I'm just going to go and read. I'll go ahead and read them. So how do you weave Willow? We have large Willow structures with very long high bits at the top. Can we just pull them down and weave them? So this is from a Lair Hillock School. And I think that's possibly been answered, but maybe there's more. And I'm just going to read the other question. So can we just cut bits off the high willow to, and uh, to whittle? And does it then keep growing? I think the answer to that was yes. Uh, but again, I'll let you answer. And then the third question was, we have taken cuttings from our our out of control willow dome to make a fence or a hedge in our very wet field. Yeah, we did that as well um, at Oin, um, and that's kind of what we're doing, trying to make fences and things because, um, well, for that last one, yeah, brilliant you can it's it's so pliable and even if you break it as long as a piece of bark is attached the the willow will still recover um so again really hard to to destroy it um the the very big high bits is really really difficult we had that at oin because as you know the the branches will get very very long and uh with little leaves on them because they'll try to get to the sun so um in one sense it's a fantastic piece of wood we did that big um dome with a lot of the big straight pieces that we cut off from the top but that's definitely an, an adult job and you know I had my mini chainsaw out and all sorts trying to just tame it a bit. There is um, a more severe option if your willow tunnel is totally out of control which is you know take a chainsaw to it and really be quite harsh really chop it down to sort of shoulder height um, we did that with a little bit just to see how it it went and it totally recovered and that gives you the takes the, the height right down. I hope I'm, I'm giving the right information here because I'm not a willow expert by any stretch of the imagination. But this is all stuff that I've learned from doing it. <laughs> the same as with the garden and actually just uh, getting your, your hands in there. Um, the weaving's fantastic. There's so much you can do. It's so pliable. Um, and because you get lots and lots of very different uh widths of branch you can use like I say the little ones to do things like baskets and um, you know make your your tripods and, and lovely little things for your peas and whatever else to grow up um 
um, to do uh, once you've got bits at the side because ours was so big, the we tried to get the wee ones still weaving in the, the smaller and the newer pieces so that the sides were filled in. But again, if we had gaps, um, we just took those kind of pencil sized pieces of of willow and and stuck them in the gaps, and they're starting to grow and fill up those. Um, it's it's really fantastic. Um, I'm not sure I quite answered those, but. Um, I, I've certainly got loads of photos and things of what we did um, and I know there's loads of videos about what you can actually do with Willow on YouTube just really quick five or ten minutes you can have a lovely tree um, we've done loads of Christmas crafts it's it's really useful yeah thank you so Karen from Lear Hillock says thank you in the chat and that, that does answer her question so that's good news and then we had I think Bob probably wants to come in on some of this stuff um and I'm just going to read the other question. Um, how did you get to the top? That was from Miss Miller. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> off uh, on the record, um, with lots and lots of safety procedures. Uh, off the record, uh, really just sort of climbing up on ladders. Um, <laughs> It, what we what you would sort of need to do officially would be you wouldn't if it is really out of control you need the sort of scaffolding um, planks to get up there and and it's it's quite a big job. I did leave the very high bits. We've also had things like you know branch cutters um, that that you can that stretch really high up. So they were really useful as well. But again, that's an, an adult tool. We didn't let the the children do that because the I. I Got bumped on the head a couple of times, let's say, from um, <laughs> falling willow branches. Um, but yeah, just take care when you're up there and, and get up as, as high as you can safely. Yeah, I think the key to it, Lindsay, is don't let it get up to that height. <laughs> you know, if you can, um, I think if you can manage to, you've got to really keep it under control. Um, and if you do get someone in, I, I, yeah, you probably do need to sort of like get someone, if it's got really tall, um, then you need to need someone professional in to sort of like just come and chop it off. Don't worry about chopping it off because it will come back. And um, there's no two ways about it. Um, but the pliability as well will be obviously better with um, the more of the younger shoots uh, than with the older ones. So if you're so sort of like I think you were asking on there, Karen, about um, some sort of like the weaving point, you'll find the weaving to be an awful lot easier with uh, the the younger the younger uh, sort of like uh, pieces of it. But um, yeah, once you've got it then yeah prepare to have it for quite a bit of time right so we have another question i think this one is possibly for bob so i'm about to plant potatoes with p1 p1s um they've been chitting for four weeks i was thinking of planting them in the bags so it's easier to dig up and find do bags work well for growing in i got early potatoes from one seed forward and put them on the window ledge would they be ready f uh, before summer holidays if I plant them now, Bob? <laughs> oh, it's uh, been so cold that I don't think it's going to make much difference, actually. Um, yeah, if they've been chitting, uh, then that's great. So chitting is a process of where you've got them sprouting. Um, first early potatoes should take 10 to 12 weeks. Um, it may be a bit tight now, um, being 24th of April, uh, but what I would do is I would get them in the ground. So probably my, my oh sorry, an entire bag or a ground. So my advice would be to plant them uh, this week. Uh, growing in bags is great. Um, you don't put any more than three in a bag. Um, that's more than enough because there's only a certain amount of space and there's also only a certain amount, certain amount of nutrition. You will not get more potatoes by putting more potatoes in a bag. Um, it doesn't it doesn't work like that. Um, if you do have the, the space to put them in the ground, then they will be able to spread out a little bit more. But particularly if you're in an environment where you've got a lot of tarmac in school or whatever, then growing in bags is absolutely perfect. Um, if you check out our website or on the Once Before website, or if you've got a tatty booklet, if you did get them from us, um, you'll see about some um, sort of like the water and everything. But you can always contact us with questions and your photos as you're progressing them. Um, on Instagram, we are growing potatoes in bags, and so we are so sort of like uh, videoing uh, the plants to video every two weeks. So you can follow us on our journey with that. Um, but uh, yeah, if you've got any questions regarding anything on seed potatoes, um, please just message us uh, either through our website or Facebook or Instagram. But yeah, bags are great for kids, so just go for it. Uh, just make sure there's a lot of light as well, because uh, 
once you put a lot of compost in, they'll get a little bit heavy. So best to have them in their final growing position. Okay. This is um, um, a, a very, I know Bob has been trying to shift so many potatoes recently. How many, how, how, how many ton? I don't know what the question is here, but I know it's a lot, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Have you managed yes. to get rid of them all now? Uh, well, uh, we're in Colliston on Sunday, okay. and um, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that that will be 1,700 kilos of wow. seed potatoes that we've given away. That's um, so, uh, yeah, they're by far and away our biggest year, so there have been lots of interest. Um, yeah, Karine, um, yeah, keep on keep on putting soil on the top. So as the, as the seed potatoes start to break through and you start to see shoots, then just keep on putting um, maybe about three or four centimetres above the shoots on top until the bag is full. That way you'll get a stronger plant and fingers crossed you'll get a few more tatties doing it. So just going to give it a, another second or two to see if anybody else is typing. I can't see. Oh, there's some, something. Somebody. Oh, this, thank you um, for your answers from Karine. Um, we're just past five o'clock. I would suggest that if we don't have any more questions that we, we close this session down, we recorded it. I will um, email everyone, including the people who haven't managed to jump on the call tonight, but are registered for the session. Even if you're thinking you won't be able to make the next one, if you still give us, if you still register and book for the session, we'll have your email address and be able to share recordings with you. And um, that's all I wanted to say. I wanted to thank all my speakers yet again. Everybody's really very knowledgeable. Um, our organization works with all things learning for sustainability. So gardening is just a, a little piece of it. And I'm learning so much about it. So thank you from um, personally for me. And so next session is on 22nd of May and we will be talking about harvesting and uh, cooking I think that's our next so it's every every month is a new exciting topic so the the link I will share the link to book the next session if you haven't been um, if you haven't booked already in the email that's coming from me so that there you will have all our contact details all the things we've spoken about today and where what your next steps are so thank you all very much and we'll see you on the the next call